Our first speaker is Cristiana Fernandez Raguas. She was a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow in the UK. She also worked in the USA as an assistant professor in food chemistry, and she is now currently working at the European Food Safety Authority. Cristina, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk to you about how we perform the risk assessment of food enzymes, specifically the assessment related to the production and characterization of the food enzyme. So in the next 30 minutes, I'll define what is a food enzyme, briefly introduce the food enzyme legal framework. I'll talk about the different food enzyme categories and the phases of the risk assessment of food enzymes delving deeper into the importance of their manufacturing and characterization to end with an overview of the applications uh, that EFSA has received uh, for assessment. And let's start refreshing our minds. What's an enzyme? As most of you may know, enzymes are biocatalysts, so they have the ability to lower the activation energy of chemical reactions, increasing the rate of reactions millions of times in many cases. They are proteins present in all living organisms. In fact, they are found in large quantities in the human body and play a key role in chemical reactions occurring, for example, during food digestion. Enzymes are also naturally present in ingredients used to make food. For example, they are responsible for the oxidation and browning of apples and avocados or for the ripening of tomatoes. And for centuries, they have been used unknownly in, in food production, like in bread or cheese making. So historically, they have been considered to be non-toxic and safe for consumers. However, food enzymes are also produced industrially and used as food improvement agents with different technological purposes to enable or enhance specific chemical reactions during food production. And they are usually purified but they may contain traces of constituents of potential concern, and therefore they have to be assessed uh, for safety. Um, and that's why food enzymes are regulated at the EU level. Previously, um, food enzymes, uh, other than those used as food additives, were not regulated at the EU level or were regulated as processing aids under um, the legislation of member states. But in 2008, Regulation 1331 introduced a common approval procedure for additives, enzymes, and flavorings used in food. But is Regulation 1332 uh, the one that harmonizes specifically rules of food enzymes in the European Union? And this legislation basically requires EFSA to evaluate the safety of all existing and new enzymes before they can be authorized <clears throat> in the European Union and included in an, in an official list of approved uh, enzymes. So a food enzyme will be included in this list if it doesn't pose a health concern to the consumer, if there is a technological need for its use, and if its use doesn't mislead um, consumers. Regarding the timeline, uh, the legal deadline that EFSA has to adopt each scientific opinion is nine months from the date we receive a valid application from Commission. However, often there are cases where clarification or additional data are, are, are required to, to complete the evaluation. So in those cases, the clock is stopped so that applicants have time to submit the requested information and therefore the deadline of nine months is, is extended. Um, who performed the risk assessment of food enzymes? Well, this is carried out by the EFSA's panel on food contact materials, enzymes and processing aids. And how we perform the assessment. Safety evaluation of food enzymes is conducted in accordance with the principles described in the scientific guidance for the submission of dossiers on, on food enzymes. The, this one, the one that we have here. And this is the updated uh, guidance, it uh, was updated in 2021. Um, from a legal point of view, uh, Regulation 1332 defines a food enzyme, uh, a food enzyme making a distinction from, from a food enzyme preparation. 
So a food enzyme is defined as a product obtained from plants, animals or microorganisms or products thereof containing one or more enzymes capable of catalyzing a specific biochemical reaction and added to food for a technological purpose at any stage of the manufacturing, processing, preparation, treatment, packaging, transport or storage of foods. On the other hand, a food enzyme preparation is a formulation consisting of one or more uh, food enzymes in which food additives or other food ingredients are added to facilitate their storage, sale, standardization, dilution or um, dissolution. Okay, as we have seen before, enzymes are present in all living things. However, commercial enzymes are basically obtained from three primary sources, animals, plants, and microorganisms. So now I would like to, to show some examples of applications that we received uh, for evaluation of often enzymes obtained from each uh, source. And as an animal derived enzymes, probably the most popular is rennet or renin, which is used for coagulation of milk in the first stage of cheese production. Um, the major enzyme in, 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 in rennet is chymosine, but it also contains some um, pepsin. And rennet is obtained from the abomasum or fourth stomach uh, of ruminants. Calf rennet is probably the, the preferred one in, in cheese making, but um, rennets from goat, uh, sheep and buffaloes are also commercialized. Another example is lysozyme. Uh, we find this enzyme in hen's uh, egg white and it can be used as bactericidal agent uh, because uh, this enzyme hydrolyzes um, the peptidoglycan uh, polymer found in bacterial cell walls, especially of uh, gram-positive microorganisms, which are the ones uh, that include many food pathogens. Um, it's used, for example, in wine making, apart from this bactericidal action, also to control some aspects of fermentation and to stabilize um, wines. Um, as examples of plant-derived enzymes, we had beta amylase extracted from barley. Uh, this is an exoenzyme that breaks down starch amylose and amylopectin into maltose. So one of its main uses is, is in brewing process. Uh, the enzyme improves the amounts of, ferment, of fermentable sugars uh, during brewing and thus this increases the, the brewing uh, yield. So it's, it's commonly used. Another interesting plant source are flowers. Here in this picture we can see cardoon flowers, which are used to obtain phytepsin, which is basically a vegetal rennet or plant coagulant. So the enzyme has been traditionally used, but is currently used as well on cheese uh, elaboration. But are microbial enzymes the one that are preferred uh, in the food industry? And, and for example, the use of this enzyme in baking processes is very extended. Bacteria like Bacillus subtilis um, is used to produce silanases. Uh, these enzymes um, hydrolyze silan polysaccharides, generating oligosaccharides, and this basically improves the characteristics of the dough during baking and may also help prevent a uh, bread uh, stalling. Fungi like aspergillus are also commonly used to produce enzymes. Uh, here we see an example of asparaginase obtained from aspergillus or isaid and this enzyme what, uh, what the enzyme does is catalyze the hydrolysis of asparagin into uh, aspartic acid and ammonia, and this reduces the content of asparagine. So its main use is in food processes that aim to reduce content in acrylamide. And one of the uses is in sliced potatoes before frying or coffee beans before roasting, so that the formation of um, acrylamide during, during the Maya reaction that takes place at these high temperatures of roasting and frying then is, is reduced. Um, Finally, uh, an example of yeast like Cliveromyces lactis has been, has been used to produce beta-galactosidase. This enzyme is widely used in the milk industry because hydrolyzes, uh, well, apart from other galactose, galactosidase, the milk sugar lactose. 
So this process is used for, for, for production of milk products that are consumed by lactose intolerant consumers. Um, so note that other microorganisms are also used to produce the same enzymes and that these microorganisms can be genetically manipulated to improve the production of the, of the enzyme at commercial scale. And we receive, um, we will see later at the end, um, a summary of the applications we, we received. Okay, so the risk assessment of food enzymes starts with an in-depth characterization of the source of the production organism, the manufacturing process, the raw materials, chemical composition, and the physical chemical properties of the food enzyme. Toxicological studies are, of course, essential, uh, and this include the assessment of potential allergenicity, allergenicity that may come from the enzyme itself, the source of the enzyme, or from substances used in the production process. A key piece in the assessment is the dietary exposure estimation, because these, together with the outcome from toxicological studies, allow us to establish a margin of exposure and then to conclude on the safety of that food enzyme under that specific um, use. Um, and I would like to mention a critical issue in the risk assessment of food enzyme, and is that the evaluation process not only consists in evaluating the safety of the enzyme itself, but also the safety of non-enzymatic constituents, which could be substances of potential concern. So these substances could be natural constituents and contaminants of the production organism, like infection, infectious agents, and this is a major focus uh, by EFSA, um, raw materials and chemicals and their residues coming from different steps of the, of the enzyme manufacturing process, and I will talk about this in the next uh, slides, or products resulting from reactions of the food enzyme with food constituents or from the degradation of the food enzyme during processing. So these substances may be removed or, or inactivating during food processing. However, in some cases, residual concentrations of the food enzyme and of these substances may remain in the final processed food. So the dietary exposure assessment to those hazards is, is key. Uh, I'm not going to deep into, into the dietary exposure as there will be a session on this topic uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, so let's delve now into the risk assessment associated to the manufacturing of food enzymes. And as just explained, uh, the safety of the commercial enzyme can be affected by a number of unknown substances that can end up in the food enzyme as a consequence of the production process. So we can say that food enzymes are concentrates containing, apart from the desired uh, enzyme protein, also some other substances. And this is the reason why the concept of total organic solids or TOS was developed for enzymes, because this concept takes into account that um, most of the organic solids in this fraction are not the enzyme per se, but also all that substances that we have uh, mentioned. So POS, a uh, total organic solid, is defined as 100% minus uh, the percentage of water minus the percentage of us. And in the case of food enzyme preparation, the percentage of excipients uh, has to be considered in this calculation as well. So for our assessment, it's essential to have a detailed description of each step of the production process of any, of any chemical treatment performed, for example, sometimes chemical treatments are, are used to modify the thermal ability of the enzyme. Also information of how many manufacturer, manufacturing sites are, are involved in the process, in the production of the, of the enzyme. And of course, information regarding the specific raw materials, reagents and processing aids used in those steps with information on their function, chemical identity, has or any other uh, identification number. We normally require qualitative data, but analytical data are needed if safety concerns exist and if there is a potential for carryover of the dose fraction into the food enzyme. 
And another requisite, of course, is that the production of the food enzyme must meet uh, food safety management system principles according with the food hygiene um, regulation. And this information here in this slide, this is applicable for all types of enzymes, regardless um, of their source. If we focus now on the production of microbial enzymes, we differentiate two main parts in the, in the production upstream processing, which basically involves the synthesis of the enzyme through fermentation, and then downstream processing, which includes uh, the recovery of the enzyme from the fermentation medium, the purification of the enzyme to remove unwanted contaminants, the concentration of the enzyme liquor, and a uh, formulation. Let's see fermentation. So the production of industrial enzymes by microorganisms is exclusively done by fermentation and, and uh, submerged and solid state fermentation are the two, the two main or the two important uh, technologies uh, available. Submerged fermentation involves the growth of the microorganism as a suspension in a high oxygen liquid medium containing different nutrients. And this is the preferred technology, um, but solid state fermentation has been gaining relevance, relevance in recent years. So we receive applications using both types of technology. In the submerged fermentation, there are three main ways of uh, growing uh, the microorganisms. Batch, where the microorganisms are inoculated in a fixed volume of medium. Uh, fed batch, where the nutrients are gradually added to the batch culture. And um, <clears throat> in the continuous uh, process, uh, the freeze medium uh, is added into the batch uh, system, but then there is a corresponding withdrawal of, of the medium containing uh, the product. In the case of the solid state fermentation, the microbial growth uh, and the product formation occurs on the surface of, um, of solid materials that have very low uh, moisture um, content. But apart from the production media, containing those carbon and nitrogen sources and micronutrients that support the growth of the microorganisms, there are other additional components used in the fermentation. And this could be antifoam agents, flocculants, pH control agents. And that's why the safety of the food enzyme uh, can be affected either by these components or by other substances like antimicrobial products that are often used during fermentation to prevent the growth of unwanted microorganisms. Also, it can be affected by potential metabolites produced during fermentation, for example, mycotoxins, which are compounds of known toxicity, or even it can be affected by the production microorganism itself or part of the production microorganism like antimicrobial resistant genes. So, we can say that all these fermentation elements can end up in the food enzymes. And that's why it's so important to have detailed information on the raw materials used and a detailed description of the fermentation process, because this will allow us to identify the hazards derived from uh, this step of the manufacturing of the, of the enzyme. Okay, let's see now the downstream processing, which um, basically involves operations aimed at purifying the food enzyme and make it safer. So these main steps are the disruption of cells in the case of intracellular enzymes and killing of fermentation mic microorganisms, the recovery of the enzyme uh, once the fermentation has been uh, completed. So the microbial biomass is removed from the fermentation broth and usually filtration or centrifugation is used for, for this um, removal. The concentration of the enzyme liquor, which is already free of microbial cells and operations like ultrafiltration can be used. And then sometimes there are additional purification um, steps, not always, but sometimes. Nevertheless, the downstream processing can be also a potential source of substance of concern for example, the agents used to kill the microorganisms. So again, we need detailed info of the raw materials used and the detailed description of each step to clearly identify the hazards derived from, from even this purification operation so that we can judge 
if there is a potential for carryover of the toes uh, into uh, the food enzyme. This has been regarding microbial enzymes. Uh, let's talk now about enzymes obtained from plant sources. In the assessment of, of this type of enzymes, we need info on whether the plant produces secondary metabolites harmful to humans and on whether the species produce non-toxic compounds. Regarding the production process, extraction now is the main operation instead of fermentation for microbial enzymes. And as we have seen before, different parts of the plant can be used to extract different enzymes like flowers, scardoon, or grains like barley or wheat. So we need uh, this uh, information regarding the, the plant, the part of the plant used to produce the enzyme. Essential information to perform our assessment course includes description of the extraction method and of any physical or enzymatic pretreatment applied and function a type of raw materials. Regarding the downstream processing, as for microbial enzymes, we need the specific procedures on how the plant biomass and products are removed after extraction, and also the methods used to concentrate the enzyme, the enzyme liquor, and also to remove or inactivate microbial contaminants, plus all processing aids used during this purification process. Here, um, we see a diagram that shows a specific production process for the obtention of um, proteases from plant sources. And basically, um, it has the same part extraction and uh, different steps of the downstream uh, processing. OK, regarding animal derived enzyme, um, some info about the source, uh, which is key for, for our assessment, includes the identification of the animal or the tissue or product that is going to be used for production and a history of previous consumption of that tissue, which should confirm the absence of adverse effects um, to humans. Also, it's required that the animal source is fit for human consumption. Of course, complies with meat inspection requirements and is handled in accordance with good hygienic practice and ensures the absence of any risk of infectivity um, from viruses or other zoonotic agents. In the production of enzymes from animal sources, we again have, we can differentiate the two main parts, extraction of the enzyme and downstream processing. And again, we need the same type of info as that required for plant enzymes and microbial enzymes. So identification of raw materials description of the methods to extract the enzyme, etc. Okay, now I would like to mention uh, that some of the applications that EFSA receives uh, seek authorization of immobilized enzymes. So by definition, immobilized enzymes, different to, to pre-enzymes in solution, are um, physically confined or attached to an inert and insoluble support material while still maintaining their catalytic activities and that can be used repeatedly and continuously. Most of the dossiers of immobilized enzymes that uh, we received are about lipases used for enzymatic interesterification of oils and fats, but also for um, psychos, uh, pimerase, which is an enzyme used for the manufacture of the allulose, a low calorie sweetener. But the potential of food enzyme immobilization um, is receiving an increased attention because it mitigates some lit limitations of free enzymes. So, for example, it allows an easy recovery of enzymes and the multiple reuse of enzymes. And compared to the free enzymes in solution, this type of enzymes are more resistant to environmental uh, changes. And that's something that the industry uh, is looking for. In terms of the immobilization technique or the attachment mode of the enzyme onto the carrier, we can differentiate physical methods like absorption and entrapment, chemical like covalent bonding and cross-linking, and physicochemical methods like microencapsulation. So again, we need to put attention to the method of immobilization to the supporting or encapsulating material 
or to any cross-linking agent used to bind the food enzyme to the support material or carrier as they may be potentially hazardous. In those cases, for our assessment, we need analytical data on the extent of leaching of those materials into the food enzyme and also the concentration into the final food. Okay, let's move now on to the characterization of the food enzyme, which constitutes another essential part of the risk assessment of food enzymes. And this includes, apart from the identification, the protein pattern, the chemical composition of the food enzyme, the enzymatic activities, purity, both chemical and microbiological, and the absence of viable cells and DNA of the production strain in the food enzyme. We need this information for at least um, three commercial batches of the food enzyme and additionally for any batch used for toxicological studies, which must be also representative of those uh, batches intended for um, commercialization. So each principal enzyme has to be identified by its UVMB and systematic name, EC number, NX number if available, and any uh, cyanine. With regards to the protein profile, essential info that we need for the assessment is the sequence of amino acids, the molecular mass, subunit structure, degree of glycosylation if relevant, and the protein pattern characteristic of at least three commercial batches. And this pattern could be obtained by SDS page analysis, size exclusion chromatography, or mass spectrometry. Also, we need the description of the main catalytic activities and side activities, if there is any. And also the activity of these enzymes should be measured using appropriate uh, methods. We also need information about the temperature, a pH range over which the food enzyme remains active, together with the optimum values for pH and temperature of the enzyme. And Another piece of information uh, which is key uh, for us, for our assessment, are the data on the thermostability of the enzyme. This data should cover a temperature range that reflects the technological role of the food enzyme and must show the temperature at which the enzyme is completely inactivated because these data are key for the dietary exposure um, assessment. Regarding the chemical composition of the food enzyme, we need data on the enzyme activity or activities, if uh, more than one are reported, the concentration of total protein, as and water. And from this data, the percentage of uh, total organic solids and the specific enzyme activity, which is the ratio between the activity and the amount of those, can be calculated. Again, in case of a food enzyme preparation, the percentage of excipients should be reported and considered in the calculation of the total organic solids. So why these characteristics are so important for the assessment of food enzymes? So these data on chemical parameters and the protein pattern um, allow us to judge the extent of variation among batches and thus uh, judge whether the manufacturing process process is, con is consistent. So we can conclude on whether the batches produ produced for commercialization are comparable and in particular and more importantly on whether the food batch used for toxicological studies can be considered representative of the commercial food enzyme. Also the protein pattern profile serve as a um, for the allergenic, to assess the allergenic potential of the food enzyme. Okay, regarding chemical and microbiological purity, the data requirement depends on the source of the enzyme. So for microbial enzymes, we need quantitative data on lead and on medium ingredients used for purpose different than nutrition or, or pH control, for example, expression inducing agents or antibiotics because these substances may be carried over into the food enzyme. Also when filamentous fungi are used to produce the food enzyme we also need concentration of mycotoxins 
in some cases, in other cases as well, not only when uh, filamentous fungi are used. Um, and the microbiological purity should be established for E. coli and Enterobacteriaceae. For enzymes of plant origin, apart from concentration of heavy metals, the food enzymes should also be screened for pesticide residues and for relevant mycotoxins. And microbiological purity uh, should be established um, in this case for those already mentioned, uh, but also for filamentous fungi and, and, and yeast. Regarding the enzymes obtained from animals, Data on chemical contamination is not required because a prerequisite is that the food enzyme derives from animals considered fit for human consumption. But microbiological purity should be established um, apart from those needed in, in plant enzymes for Campylobacter species, for Ciga toxin producing uh, E. coli in the case of uh, ruminants, and uh, for the hepatitis E virus for enzymes um, obtained from, from big sources. Okay, this is regarding uh, purity. And finally, um, regarding the absence of viable cells of the production strain, this uh, should be established for all food enzymes, except for those obtained using non-genetically modified production strains that have been granted QPS, or qualified presumption of safety status and the absence of DNA from the production strain in the, in the food enzyme should be established for food enzymes obtained using genetically modified production strains and also for food enzymes obtained using non-genetically modified production strains carrying antimicrobial uh, resistant genes. But this is a much broader topic and, and there will be a couple of sessions, one tomorrow and one on um, Friday, uh, so that we'll explain with much more detail uh, these um, requisites. And I would like to end this presentation with a summary of the dossiers that we have received for, for assessment. And as we have seen, commercial enzymes are basically obtained from three primary sources animals, plants, and microorganisms. But out of these three sources, microorganisms are preferentially used as source of um, industrial enzymes. And this is reflected in the number of applications that uh, EFSA receives. As we can see in this table, there is a huge difference between the number of dossiers seeking authorization of microbial enzymes and those corresponding to plant and, and animal enzymes. In particular, more than 300 microbial enzymes dossiers against 13 plant enzymes dossiers and 21 animal enzymes dossiers. From, from those dossiers on microbial enzymes, almost half correspond to enzymes obtained from genetically modified strains. Regarding the type of microorganism, well, different uh, microorganisms have been employed for the production of, of industrial enzymes from eukaryotic systems such as yeast and fungi to prokaryotic systems as bacteria. Fungi first and then bacteria produce most industrial microbial enzymes and the great majority comes from a, this limited number of genera, which is Aspergillus, Trichoderma and Bacillus species. These predominate, but also Streptomyces and Cluberomyces species are next uh, in the list. Among fungi, uh, Aspergillus niger is the most employed microorganism for enzyme production, followed by Bacillus subtilus among the most employed um, bacteria used for the production of microbial uh, enzymes industrially. If we classify the enzymes regarding their main enzymatic activity, we have amylases and proteases in the top list of producing enzymes, followed by lipases and silanases, but there are much more types of enzymes um, that we receive for evaluations, but these are the most are in the top list. And here, just to show a list of the specific non-genetically modified species used as source of food enzymes, and here, a list of those um, genetically modified uh, species. 
And finally, um, well, here just is a summary of the main guidelines documents related to the risk assessment of, of food enzymes. There is the link just in case you, you want to have um, a look at it. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christina, for your presentation. We have one question from a chat from Arno Villas. And the question is if there is a need of requesting spore free products from uh, the enzymes produced by spore forming microorganisms. C can you say again, please? I didn't hear well. Is, is there, if there is a need of requesting spore free products from these enzymes produced by spore forming microorganisms? Okay, I understood. If there is a need for requesting a spore free. Yeah, spore products. free products. Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. The, the food enzymes should be free of those of those or of the of the source of the microorganism. So that is one of the one of the main points of, of our assessment, but probably this will be explained with more detail in 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 the next sessions that we'll talk about uh, the source of the of the food enzyme here i have focus on on the manufacturing and, and characteristics uh, and all the information that we need for our assessment but yes the the, the absence of export of spores is required in the in our product in the food enzyme that is going to be used um, in food processing yeah, okay. I have answer. Yeah. I'm not sure if I answer the question. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure you did. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.